It was ground zero for rock music and debauchery. From mafia connections to Charles Manson to 80s heavy metal and beyond, the Whiskey A Go Go has a wild past. The founder of the Whiskey A Go Go, Elmer Valentine, was born in Chicago, enlisted in the Air Force, and fought in World War II. After leaving the military, he returned to the Windy City to work as a police officer. But Valentine had a shady side gig. He told Vandy Fair, I used to moonlight running nightclubs for the outfit, for gangsters. The law caught up to him, and he was charged with extortion. The charges didn't stick, but Chicago was getting too hot, so Valentine headed west. He landed in Los Angeles in 1960 and put his nightclub experience to use, opening a club named PJ's. The club attracted attention when up-and-coming singer-songwriter Trini Lopez recorded a live album there, which became a commercial success. Valentine knew the nightclub business was for him, but he wasn't sure about LA. So in 1963, he sold his share of PJ's and went to Europe in search of inspiration. In Paris, he stumbled upon a nightclub called the Whiskey A Go Go that was packed with young people on a nightly basis. Valentine returned to the US with a big idea. In the early 1960s, the Sunset Strip was no longer happening the way it had been during Hollywood's golden age. But that all changed when Elmer Valentine came home with a plan to replicate the success of the Whiskey A Go Go in America. In an interview with Vanity Fair, he recalled, I wanted to open a discotheque because I saw what was happening, the frenzy and the people in the lines. Valentine set up shop on Sunset Boulevard in a club called The Party that had seen better days. The Whiskey A Go Go officially opened in 1964. But in order to attract a crowd, Valentine needed an act. He came upon a talented young singer-songwriter named Johnny Rivers, who later achieved considerable fame for his song Secret Agent Man. Rivers was the house act at the nearby club Gazeri's. Valentine was instantly infatuated with his sound and the fact that it brought in plenty of customers. Valentine's friend, record producer Lou Adler, convinced him to offer Rivers a residency at the Whiskey. Rivers accepted and became a regular at the venue, bringing his growing fan base with him. Word of mouth spread quickly, and the Whiskey soon became a hotspot for budding rock and roll acts. Within its first year, the whiskey garnered national attention, becoming the hangout for Tinseltown royalty like Steve McQueen and Jane Mansfield. Johnny Rivers recalled, Everybody was there. I mean, you'd look up and there was Cary Grant dancing. But the whiskey didn't just appeal to American celebrities. When the Beatles embarked on their first tour of the United States, they made time to visit the club. The whiskey earned a reputation as a place where inhibitions were optional with racy stories involving the Beatles, English actor James Mason, and Mansfield that are too spicy to talk about. The Doors were another of the Whiskey's house acts. Although band members Jim Morrison and Ray Manzarek, who were studying film at UCLA at the time, were initially reluctant to join the Sunset Strip scene. Manzarek told Vanity Fair, the whiskey was for Hollywood swingers. It was the antithesis of everything artistic that you could imagine. Everyone derided it. And then we wind up being the house band there. How ironic life is. The doors opening for Johnny Rivers. While Morrison's drug and alcohol-fueled exploits eventually got them banned from the club, they only enhanced his reputation as a venue where anything could happen. During the 1960s, the whiskey inspired its share of trends. When Johnny Rivers performed at the club, a young female DJ played records between sets in a transparent enclosure, elevated above the dancing patrons. Because the venue wasn't terribly big, special accommodations had to be made to allow room for both a stage and a DJ booth. Elmer Valentine knew how unique the setup was and arranged a contest to hire a hip young lady to fill the role. They found a winner. But her mother refused to let her do it, so Valentine hired his cigarette girl, Patty Brockhurst, for the gig and accidentally kicked off one of the defining dance crazes of the 1960s. You see, Brockhurst was hired as a DJ, but her habit of dancing to the music she spun turned into something much bigger. As Valentine told Vanity Fair, she had on a slit skirt and we put her up there, so she's up there playing the records. She's a young girl, so while she's playing them, all of a sudden she starts dancing to them. It was a dream. It worked. Knowing that this would help put the whiskey on the map, Valentine quickly had two more platforms built and hired more dancers to occupy them. And here's the world-famous Whiskey A Go-Go on the Strip, a favorite dancing spot for both the mods and movie stars who want to get it on. Though Elmer Valentine had pretty much left his shady dealings behind in Chicago, some of his old mobster connections followed him out to sunny Southern California when news of the Whiskey's success got back to them. Some of the old gang showed up at the Whiskey and tried to force Johnny Rivers to sign a contract, requiring him to fork over some of his earnings. When Lou Adler stepped in, he was met with a pretty gruesome death threat. Luckily, Valentine showed up to defuse the situation, but he did have to go to Chicago to meet his old connections in person to convince them to lay off. Valentine rarely flexed his mob muscles, but he wasn't afraid to when it was called for. Notorious hitman Felix Anthony Milwaukee Phil Aldericio was a buddy of Valentine. 
who employed his, quote, help from time to time. For example, rival establishment Gazeri's was so bothered when the whiskey hijacked rivers from them that the owner sent one of his connections, Charles Carmen Inglesia, aka Chucky English, to threaten Valentine into giving back rivers. Valentine had Aldericio, quote, respond for him, and the matter was instantly laid to rest. The Sunset Strip of the early 1960s wasn't the hottest LA neighborhood. That is, not until the whiskey came along and shocked the place back to life. The club's owners worked hard to attract young adults. A Sunset Strip historian told Curbed Los Angeles that one of them noticed some teenagers lingering around Hollywood High School, recalling, he asked them if they would just hang around the whiskey that night, just at the opening, so it looked like something was going on inside. Nearby venues followed suit. So, by the mid-60s, the Sunset Strip was no longer just the stomping grounds of Hollywood's old guard. The hippie element had moved in and planted its flag firmly in the territory. However, the sudden and massive influx of youths caused problems for any Sunset Strip business that didn't play live music. They complained of kids engaging in all sorts of degenerate activity and blocking traffic with their antics. One popular club, Pandora's Box, located on a traffic island, was known as the epicenter of underage decadence. It was proposed that the club be torn down, loitering be banned, and a 10 p.m. curfew be implemented. On November 12, 1966, a crowd of young people held a peaceful protest at Pandora's Box. Some fights broke out and numerous arrests were made, but it was a mostly non-violent affair. Unfortunately, the protest was in vain, and the club was torn down in 1967. The end of the 1960s hippie movement was foreshadowed by the Tate-LaBianca murders in 1969. One officer summed up the murders when he said, In all my years, I have never seen anything like this before. But before Charles Manson attracted worldwide notoriety, he was a musician and songwriter, operating on the fringes of the LA music scene, and a regular at the Whiskey A Go Go. Manson caused quite a stir at the club with his bizarre behavior. In his book Manson, The Life and Times of Charles Manson, author Jeff Gwynn writes, he tipped back his head and threw out his arms. It seemed as though electrical sparks flew from Charlie's fingers and hair. As tolerant as the whiskey was, it couldn't tolerate Manson. The club's co-owner, Mario Maglieri, told Vanity Fair about a time he found Manson hanging around in a booth after hours, saying, I said, what are you doing here? We're closed. You can't be there. He looked at me and says, I can have you killed. And I grabbed him, threw him out. I should have strangled that son of a while the Manson family's crimes didn't seriously hurt the Sunset Strip live music scene, after the brutal killings of Sharon Tate and her friends, the psychedelic shimmer of the swinging 60s was noticeably dimmer. By the 1970s, rock and roll was no longer confined to nightclubs, having migrated to massive theaters and outdoor venues. This, combined with disco's domination of the airwaves, dealt the whiskey a considerable blow. But Elmer Valentine refused to go down without a fight. He tried to turn the club into a venue for cabaret performances, but the move didn't work, and the whiskey closed down in 1974. However, the whiskey reopened in 1976, just in time to capitalize on the rapidly growing punk rock and new wave movement. Up-and-coming acts like the Go-Go's, the Runaways, Dead Kennedys, Blondie, and many others became regulars at the whiskey, bringing their followers with them. The Sunset Strip, once populated by long-haired hippies, was now occupied by punks and mohawks. But this era didn't last long, largely thanks to a little band from Pasadena called Van Halen. Fueled by Eddie Van Halen's explosive electric guitar pyrotechnics, the band brought a harder-edged sound and a party attitude to the whiskey stage, paving the way for another music trend that would typify the club through the 1980s. It was the dawn of the Decade of Decadence. Van Halen may have kicked open the whiskey's door for the budding Sunset Strip heavy metal scene, but it was Motley Crue who held that door open. Formed in 1981, Motley Crue became regulars at the club and quickly gained a reputation for their high decibel depravity. That's when we really took over the strip. It was just crazy. The whiskey shut down in 1982, but its reopening in 86 coincided with a time when heavy metal was really taking off, and the club once again became a hard-rocking hotspot. It was just one of many Sunset Strip hangouts that competed for the metal crowd, along with the Rainbow Bar and Grill, Gazeri's, and the Roxy. Bands like Warrant, Rat, Guns N' Roses, and Metallica played early shows there in front of crowds of young fans pumping their fists to high-octane riffs. The whiskey has been featured in dozens of movies and TV shows over the decades. Most recently, it was spotted in the Amazon Prime video series, Daisy Jones and the Six. The series takes place in the late 1970s and follows a fictional band as they traverse the LA music scene. 
which, of course, includes the whiskey. The club was also the backdrop for Benjamin Braddock and Elaine Robinson's first kiss in The Graduate. But that's not all. The iconic venue was also featured in films like The Doors, Roadie, and Get Him to the Greek, and TV shows like Mod Squad, Entourage, and Lucifer. In 2006, the whiskey was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame where its place in rock music history will be remembered forever. Its founder, Elmer Valentine, died in 2008 at the age of 85. These days, while the whiskey is still a trendy spot for hard rock bands and their fans, it's no longer the place where hungry young bands play in hopes of getting noticed. The fabled venue lives on as a destination for more established groups. Second-generation club owner Mike Maglieri Jr. told KPCC-FM, After the 80s invasion, the scene kind of died down. So there wasn't just a following of just people who would come here every night. So we had to do something to just ensure that the room would get filled up. The Whiskey A Go-Go's head-banging, hard-rocking, tail-shaking heyday may be long gone, but with a good buzz, a loud band, and a little imagination, it's possible to teleport yourself back to the club where decorum had the night off and the decibels came out to play.